exciting and relevant topic right now, um, taking your business online. A lot of folks are looking at if they haven't um, gone to e-commerce and um, started looking at ways to go online. Um, they're going to, uh, they know that sort of even coming out of the reopening, there will be a, a need for um, folks to be able to shop online and to, to get a flavor of your business um, through um, a website, through other um, techniques that Matt will share with you today. So with that, Matt, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you. Sounds good. And you'll have to keep an eye on the chat because I actually can't see the chat and the screen share at the same time, so. I'm not yeah, sure why wanna, that is today, but do you want to take questions um, at the end? Do you want to? Yeah, take let's take questions at the end because perfect. Um, we're going to cover a lot of material in a really short amount of time because I want to leave time for questions. Perfect. And so, basically, um, I work with Hook SEO Digital Marketing. We're a digital marketing agency. Um, been doing this forever, and uh, I've written a couple books. I do a podcast blah, 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 lots of things. So I have a lot of information that I can gather from a lot of locations. Um, and I've been doing work with the Hillsborough Chamber for about four years. I'm also on the Small Business Executive Council. So that's a little bit about me quick. I don't want to dwell on it too much so we can get right to it. So what does the future hold is the important number one question, right? So what is going to happen? Pretty much nobody knows. Anyone who uh, is saying that they know what's going to happen is doesn't know what's going to happen. There's basically nothing like this in this current economy has ever happened before. So nobody knows the answer. Um, straight up, this is a survey that was done. The result came out this morning. Uh, it's about 1800 people who are all um, either business owners, leaders, or they are people involved in like the startup business community. Um, and this was some information I think people would find helpful. Um, so the dark blue bar is as soon as possible. And then the light blue is in one to two months and then three to six months, six to nine months or next year. 37% of people said they would return to their office. 33% said they would return to a restaurant right away. Um, sending kids to school, 28%. That was pretty high. I was kind of surprised on that one. I think people are just tired of having their kids at home all the time. Um, traveling 27%, but they didn't specify if traveling meant getting in your car and going somewhere or like traveling on an airplane. So obviously there's some difference in, in those things. Um, going to the movies, attending a large event, both pretty small. I think that was pretty obvious. Um, I think that what we can see here though, is that you're three months out from getting kind of 60% of people back to normal. Um, just because the government says that you can go out doesn't mean people are going to go out, right? Um, so I think that's something you need to keep in mind. And another thing that's, um, there's a lot of competing theories, positive, negative, you know, on, on the outsides, you've got people saying, oh, this is going to last like 24 to 48 months. We're going to be locked in our house. Obviously, that's probably not the case. Or they say it's a hoax, probably also not the case, right? Um, but some of the kind of newer theories, one of them is called the wave theory. The wave theory is that there is a huge wave of business of people waiting to spend money. So they've saved their money, they've been holding on to it. And then as soon as things open up and they're going to be able to spend money, you're going to see a, a wave shape uh, of business come out where it's going to ramp up really fast as you know the people who can't wait to get stuff done or they have an immediate need. And then there's also going to be kind of a high point and then it's kind of slowly go back to normal. Um, again, going to depend on industry. It's also a thing called the repeating dollar theory, which is, uh, it's named different things depending upon who you talk to, but that's if you were to give a, a dollar to the coffee shop, the dollar that they get from you, they spend to buy on coffee or, or biscuits or something. And the, the bakery spends that same dollar on flour and, and so that $1 generates more than $1 of economic impact. And the government pushed in, the federal government has pushed $2 trillion in to an economy that generally only grows about half a trillion dollars a year. So $2 trillion multiplied by the amount of economic growth, there could be 
this could eventually, uh, meaning probably, you know, Q3 and Q4 of next year, be a huge lift to business. Now, I'm hoping that's what happens. Um, but from the people that I've spoken to who run things like investment funds and stuff like that, uh, that's what they're looking for. Um, so everything is going to be slow now. Obviously, it is probably not going to get any worse than it is now unless something else happens um and you know we could see a general return to almost where we were at before uh by q4 so that's kind of the wave theory um always think about consumer confidence um in your specific industry are your customers going to be comfortable coming back to use your business that's all that means so if you don't think that they're confident to come back to use your business that you need to change how you're doing your business to make them feel comfortable um, also you need the ability to adapt to osha and and local regulations stick with the chamber um, go to the chamber covid information website um, you can find it just go to hillsborough Cham uh, hillsborough chamber and then it's like the first thing on the page and uh, you know go to wake up come to these things get informed uh, make sure you're following, you're on the chamber mailing list. Um, they will have information about regulations and, and you know, this kind of stuff. All right, so let's get into getting your business online. So the first thing that you should do if you're a local business is get on the map. And when I say get on the map, I mean Google Maps. You're looking at local business, 71% of consumers use Google Maps to find a local business before anything else. So if you want to get 71% of customers, you better be on the map. Okay. Um, now that doesn't mean that you also ignore everywhere else. And I'll get to that in a minute. But the first thing to get on the Google Map is Google My Business. Uh, in our industry, we call it GMB because we like to turn everything into an acronym. So uh, get on the uh, Google My Business. It's basically a form you fill out. So you go to a page, they ask you, what's your address? Where's your location? Blah, 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 blah. Put in all the information about your business, uh, upload a photo, upload your logo, put that stuff in, say, put in your hours of operation. They have some new, if you haven't been to it for a while, they have COVID updates on there. So you could put still open or temporarily closed, um, curbside pickup is an option now. So the things like that you need to update. If you haven't updated your Google My Business, update it now. Um, just like Google My Business, there's one for Bing called Bing Places. Got some music. <laughs> All right. So Bing Places, very similar to Google My Business. Uh, it's just on Bing. And... The thing with Bing is that a lot of other search engines lease Bing's results. Um, so you've probably got about another 15% or so of people on Bing places. And most businesses forget to get on Bing places. So you can get a kind of a jump on other people. Um, also, there is now it's called Apple Maps Connect. And Apple used to pull their data from Foursquare. And now they have their own system. Uh, Apple Maps Connect, you go in, you create an Apple ID if you don't already have one, and then same thing as Google My Business, you just fill out the form. Um, that means that we'll also get you on like the Apple Connect car systems that are like, like car navigation systems and stuff like that. Um, the next thing, NAP citations, that's another acronym. It stands for name, address, and phone. So... NAP citations are other places on the internet where your business can be listed. Uh, these are important for a couple of reasons. One of them is sometimes people are looking for you and they're not necessarily on Google, right? Um, the other thing that's important is Google and Bing look at citations on other sites to decide how, uh, I guess, how authentic your business is um, to make sure that you're a real business and they rank you higher if you're on more of those citation sites. And being ranked higher in the map means you're more likely to have someone select your business over a competitor. There's also local, local directories. Make sure you're in the chamber, right? If you're a chamber member, you get listed in the chamber directory. 
Um, there's to your house.com. Um, Connie Irvine has CMK connections. There's a whole bunch of local ones. There's also um, data providers. Data providers are like Info Group, New Star, Factual, Foursquare. There's there's hundreds of them. Uh, those are the biggest four. Uh, if you don't know how to get on a citation list or through a data provider, it's inexpensive. Um, I think our service it's less than 150 bucks to get on a hundred of them. So if that's something you're interested in, you can always message me, and there's lots of ways to do it. Websites. If you have a business, you should have a website, period. They need somewhere to look you up, right? Um, since the phone book basically doesn't exist anymore, if they can't type your name into Google and you don't come up, there's no point, okay? Um, and I'll get to some inexpensive ways to do websites if you don't have one in a minute. But first thing, you need to make sure that these things are on your website right now. What do you offer? How are you keeping me safe if I do come to get your product? When can I get it? How do I get it? And what's the best way to reach you? Those five pieces of information are going to make sure that you are getting as much business as you can when people go to your website. The worst thing that you can do is have a pre-COVID time update like website that has not been updated and still says stuff like open for breakfast when you're no longer open for breakfast or doesn't have anything, any information about how to do curbside pickup, how to call, you know, maybe it has your old phone number, you know, any of that yeah. stuff, you might as well just not bother. You'd be better to turn it off at that point. So you either need to update it with this information or get it turned off because it's just going to harm you. And it's better if people found you on Google My Business instead. Um, again, if you don't know how to update your website or whatever, there's lots of providers through the chamber. We could do it. Other companies can do it. Um, and we'll get into more stuff about that in a second. E-commerce websites. There is WooCommerce that goes with WordPress. There's Magento. There's BigCommerce. There's Shopify. There's lots of, of e-commerce sites if you need to start selling product online. Um, there's various options uh, depending upon price and how much of the work is done by another company um, that's going to make a difference. Like Wix, you could start out a Wix site for free, um, but you can't sell on it for free. And oh, there's a typo. Oops. Um, anyway, you can sell on your Wix site. Uh, you can't sell on your Wix site for free. You have to upgrade to do that. Um, but I think it's $7 a month or something. It's pretty cheap. Um, you, there's Squarespace has online carts. Um, if you're a restaurant, you can use Uber Eats, DoorDash, Grubhub, Postmates, Seamless, Kula Cart, Chow Now, Menufy, Order Spoon, Olo, Menu Drive, Gloria Foods, Zuppler. There's a zillion of them. Okay. The important thing to do is figure out what your customer wants. Use the one that your customers want. And if you are a restaurant, um, I don't know if we have any restaurant people on. I don't see any that I know of immediately, but um, there's no reason why you can't have people order through Uber Eats, through DoorDash, through Grubhub, through Postmates, uh, like have them all, right? Um, so uh, if you're trying to sell retail or like a service-based thing, if you're service-based, you probably don't need e-commerce on your site unless people are paying for the service in advance. So it might be something like, you know, pay to get um, somebody to come out and do a backflow test or something or um, pay to have them come out to do some kind of quick servicing or whatever. Usually you just want them to contact you so that you can get a hold of them. Really good idea for your website. If you have someone who is like uh, an office administrator or, you know, you have a reception person, a uh, dispatcher, something like that, is to have live chat on your website. If you're a solopreneur, um, live chat can get a little overwhelming sometimes, but you could have live chat that connects with your phone. Um, there's a bunch of different apps for that. Um, if you need some suggestions on those, just let me know. Uh, but again, you want to use what your customers want to use, not necessarily what you want to use. So, uh, you know, if all your customers want to use Grubhub, uh, 
You better be on Grubhub, right? Uh, if you are using a system that costs money for every sale, like they're taking a percentage. Um, run. Well, I, I wouldn't say necessarily run because it might be easy for some people. Um, you know, like it's a lot easier to get on DoorDash than it is to build DoorDash yourself. But um, you can increase your price on the platform. So there's no law that says that you have to have the same price on your menu on your website that you have on DoorDash, right? So you could always add a little bit to it. Um, but I would always try and encourage your people to order directly through you, right? Like call us to get 10% off if DoorDash is gonna charge you 15, right? Because then you're saving 5%. Um, and a lot of times you can make up with it, um, make up that, that difference with tipping and stuff like that, so. Um, also people tend to order more when you give them a deal. So even if you give somebody 10% off, you know, they might buy 10% more stuff. So that's something you'll need to work out. Um, and we'll get a little bit more into kind of the social media side later. So there's different types of websites and security. Um, a managed platform is something like Shopify where uh, Shopify manages Shopify. You don't have to do it. You just put your products and stuff in and, and, and put your website in. So it's like half of the work is yours and half of the work is theirs. Um, managed hosting would be something like our company does where we host your website, but it's still your website 100%. Whatever you want to do with it, you do with it. But you don't do with, deal with any of the hosting server end side. If you're somewhere like, say, GoDaddy, then you can go in or you know, you're on Bluehost or whatever, you can go in and make changes to your hosting, right? And you can mess with your SSL certificates or your DNS and, and whatever. And honestly, the majority of the time that stuff gets broken, it's because somebody's in there messing around with settings that they don't understand what they do. Um, I think if managing websites and stuff is not your job or something that you know a lot about, I think you should go with having somebody else host it or go with a completely managed platform where somebody else is doing all the work. Of course, they cost more, but when they cost more because somebody else is doing the work for you. I think it's important. Uh, a lot of people kind of get scared of doing updates to their websites because if you update something, you might break it. But the real risk is you don't update it and then someone can break into it. And nine times out of 10, when a website gets broken, or hacked or something happens and they call me after they've already tried to fix it and now it's even more of a disaster because they don't know what to do and they've made it worse and we look at it and it's because they didn't get the updates done like the security patches done. So you wanna make sure your security is up to date. You wanna make sure that you're using good passwords. Um, a good password is not a password that you use anywhere else. Uh, I highly recommend using something like LastPass that holds all your passwords for you. Um, and then having some kind of, of um, like two-factor authentication. So you log into LastPass, it sends a code to your phone, and then you type in the code also. And then you can get in and get access to all your passwords to every different site. And it can create the passwords for you, and then you don't even know what the password is. And that is the 100% safest way to do it. Um, if you think, you know, it's not a big deal and you're using the same password as you are for your bank, as you are for your Facebook, as you are for your website, then all you really need to do is talk to somebody whose website got hacked. They found out what the password is and then they put a bunch of porn ads on their website and then they advertised it through their Facebook ad account because it had the same password and they used the money from your bank because it had the same password. So new passwords, people. One more thing. Um, if you're going to be working from home, like most people are now, um, people's home networks don't have the security of, of the average office network. So it should be a, a consideration to get something like a VPN. Um, that's a virtual private network. Talk to a computer provider who can do that for you. Um, there's a whole bunch in the chamber who could do it. Uh, Blue Arch is a good one. Um, also, there's uh, 
your computer guy, Tim Chalmer, um, Northwest CSI, James Hansen, um, lots of people who can provide office security that can be extended to your house. And along with that comes data security. And I know this isn't most people's favorite topic, obviously, but data security is a big problem. So data security would be like, okay, say somebody's working at home and they're working on their personal computer on for your business, like an employee or something like that. They can be saving, you know, important financial documents or things for your clients, client data and stuff on the same computer that like their kids are using. You know, it's, it's just not a safe way to do it. So you should have some kind of offsite storage that they log into. Uh, that's your OneDrive, uh, Zoho Work Drive. There's, um, I mean, there's a whole bunch of them, Dropbox, whatever. Uh, but make sure if you do pick one, that it has encryption protection. That's the important thing. Encryption protection means that if somebody is working wherever and they get a virus that encrypts all their files, they're not gonna encrypt all the files for your entire office and shut your business down. So encryption protection means that they can, uh, the, the provider of your data hosting, like your cloud hosting, like OneDrive or whatever, Dropbox, if all the stuff gets encrypted, they can give you an unencrypted backup. Um, so that way your business is not completely lost. You may also want to consider um, there's some data uh, loss insurance uh, that you can get. Any of your insurance carriers here should be able to find that. So here's Zuckerberg talking about the, how they're sorry and it was a big mistake. This is about the privacy thing. But what I'm talking about in this one is that everybody forgot that they hate Facebook. So it, it seems like only a few weeks ago or maybe, you know, a few months ago that everybody was like, Facebook is terrible. It's bad for us and it's attention stealing and blah, 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 blah. And they made a big, you know, everybody has 10 friends who made the big announcement. I just don't think this is healthy for me. So I'm going to get off Facebook forever and blah, 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 or I'm going to take a break. And then as soon as they're locked in their house, they're on Facebook seven hours a day almost everyone at this point uh, from a consumer standpoint is on Facebook. And I know there are lots of business owners who will argue with me to the end of the earth and they will be like, well, I've never been on Facebook and my vendor isn't on Facebook and my client isn't on Facebook. Cause they have one example of one type of person who might not be on Facebook. Well, surprise, 99% of people are on at least some platform and anyone in the consumer spending range uh, for most businesses. And that's your, you know, mid twenties to, you know, any age at that point are probably on Facebook. By far, Facebook has the most users and anyone can argue with me about it all they want, but then I can look at their advertising data and look at my advertising data and see that we're just crushing them. On, on dollars for sales and, and CPM metrics, which I'll get into in a minute. You need to be posting what you offer on Facebook and you need to back it with some ad spend. Now, when I say ad spend, I don't mean you gotta go out and spend $1,000. If you're posting for your business, on average, if you have less than 5,000 followers, you've got about five to 10% of your people even seeing one thing that you post a day. If you want anybody to see it, you need to put a couple bucks behind it. My favorite thing to do, especially for local businesses, is put a circle a few miles around your business in, in for a post, boost it to that few mile circle, and you don't really need to do a whole lot of targeting unless you have a really specific clientele, and do it like a dollar a day. So if you put a post like, we do curbside pickup. Um, this is the times that we're open now. These are the things we're doing to keep you safe. You post that and then you boost it and you say, I wanna boost this to everybody in a three mile radius between the ages of 25 and 60 and go. 
and do it for like two weeks, cost you 14 bucks, you probably reach thousands of people. If that's not worth 14 bucks, then, you know, I don't know how else you're going to advertise and reach that many people. Instagram's the same way. You can also boost to Facebook and Instagram at the same time. Um, Instagram, you want to entice people with photos. People are tired of seeing pictures of people trying to do stupid things in their house to entertain themselves at this point. It's been going on for two months. They're like, okay, they're pretty much over it. Um, I don't know how many people I've seen lately that said, I was like, oh, I haven't seen you on Instagram much lately. And they're like, yeah, I don't use it anymore because it's boring now. All it is is pictures of people in their houses and pictures of the banana bread that they made. So make sure that um, you want to have photos that are different, that are going to stand out. And again, you want to be telling people what you can offer them now and how you're going to keep them safe. And if you are a business who serves businesses, you've got to be on LinkedIn. You have to be on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is not just a bunch of people looking for jobs anymore. LinkedIn has exploded. If you're not posting on LinkedIn right now, you are losing business. That's just 100%. And if you don't have any people on LinkedIn, go on LinkedIn, find every vendor that you have, every friend who's a business person you know, people you know from Chamber, or any of your other networking activities and make friends with them on LinkedIn. You don't have to message them. You don't have to do anything. Just send them a request. They will become uh, one of your connections or called connections on LinkedIn. Once they're you're one of your connections, then they can see your stuff. It's just like having a personal Facebook account. When people are friends with you, they can see your stuff. LinkedIn is the same way. Only more people see more of your stuff because people post less often. Uh, TikTok or Snapchat, unless you're already using it and you already have a following or you have a client base that is probably maybe 30 and under predominantly, you're not going to need to use Snapchat, Snapchat or TikTok at all. Um, that is a whole nother story, but there's also a whole bunch of industry specific sites um, like Howl's and uh you know, TripAdvisor and stuff like that that you can use depending upon your industry. Also, don't forget to use stuff like there's Reddit. Uh, if you haven't been on Reddit, um, there is a Reddit specifically for Hillsboro. It's like a forum site. Um, so you can go on the Hillsboro Reddit. Um, it's mostly non-commercial, but they have some stuff there that you can post for like nonprofits. Um, you can ask questions. You can see what people are talking about. Next door is another one. Um, there's also patch, which I didn't list here. There's alignable. Alignable is mostly for business owners and managers. So alignable is a good one to be on. Uh, a lot of people don't know that you can post events and stuff on alignable. Um, you can do that on patch also. Um, I posted this event on alignable and a couple of people shared it and a couple of those people are here now. So, uh, it's worth it to kind of spread out to these other platforms. So advertising, PPC stands for pay-per-click. That's your, like, when you search for something on Google, and then there's, like, the few ads at the top for whatever it is. Pay-per-click still works. Uh, it works really well for specific things um, that somebody is looking for. And like I said, it has to be a specific thing. So the idea of the difference between a pay-per-click ad and a social media ad is pay-per-click, people are searching for what you have. In social media ads, you're searching for people who want what you have. And that way they're opposites. So a good example of that would be if my toilet is leaking and it's gonna ruin my floor, I go to Google and I type in plumber in Hillsborough and then there's a, a map that will come up with a few. And then there's also the ads of, you know, emergency plumber in Hillsboro. And you can just click on that because I've clicked on what I am looking for. And then if you're running a pay-per-click ad for that term that I typed in, like Hillsboro plumber or emergency plumber Hillsboro or whatever, if you've bid on that keyword, then I have the option to click on it. And then maybe I'll get business through, you know, um, I can 
follow through to the website, call you, whatever, right? Social media ads, you are looking for people who fit the profile of people who do business with you. So it wouldn't be a good way for an emergency plumber to advertise. You wouldn't want to be like, okay, I'm going to try and find everyone who has a toilet and see if it's leaking. I mean, it's just not a good way to do it, right? Now, if you do have a specific target market, for example, a lot of our business advertising, we do for people who sell things to people in the real estate industry. So it's easy for me to do targeting for them because I can say, I want to target everyone who is in the National Association of Realtors or uh, works for Keller Williams, right? So now I can push ads in front of people who are my target audience and that's how social media ads work. Now, there is also a hybrid ad system that uh, it's called Google Smart Ads. Google Smart Ads are extremely effective. Um, you pretty much need to be spending, it, it depends on your industry, but you're probably going to be looking at a minimum of about five or $600 a month to get into Google Smart Ads in an effective way. But what happens is you basically put in your services and the geographical area that you want. And Google will try to advertise to those people in that area on any of their platforms, um, except YouTube, but I can get to that in a minute. So that's a good way if you're a business, um, say that you know, you're know you an electrician or like some kind of service-based business, you're a roofer, you're you know any of that kind of stuff. Those are good for those. Social media ads, um, you do have the ability to target. Um, but again, you want to be targeting, you know, uh, if you're a business, like a local business, it's a good idea to use kind of what I call wide open ads where you just target the location. So like if you're the toy store in downtown Hillsborough and I was going to run an ad for them, um, I would run that for, you know, five miles around and um, probably people who have children. That's the only targeting that I would use. Um, I might not even use that much targeting. I might just straight up just do five mile circle around their business. Because Facebook's advertising system is going to try to find the people who are going to give you the most response to your ad. And as people respond to it, it will learn and it will tre keep trying to find more people. And now this is the part that people don't understand about Facebook ads. Facebook ads is it's the most advanced advertising platform ever. And almost every person I know who doesn't use them has said they tried to use them and it didn't work. And this is why it didn't work. It didn't work because they didn't train it how to find the people they want. It's like, it's, it's the, the way that Facebook ads work. I'll give you an example. So if I have my law firm and I want to run Facebook ads for people who have maybe, you know, like a business lawyer. So I'm going to target business owners and I just want to give them information about my law firm. So I'm doing that when someone from there um, goes to their website, Facebook knows that the person clicked on it, went to their website. It knows if they called them. It knows if they went into their office as long as they have their phone on them, which pretty much everybody does all the time. So it can say this person who clicked on the ad, went to their website, and then eventually went into their office is a good example of a person that this business is trying to reach. So we want to find people similar to this person and it will try to find any similarities between that person and somebody else who eventually does the same action. Now, if two people have done it, now it's got two people to choose from to try and build a profile. And it's basically building up a profile over and over and over and over the more you train it of who is the right person for this business. And the same thing works if you're selling e-commerce or if you're trying to get people to physically come into your store, if you're trying to get people to go to an event, all of that stuff is stuff that Facebook's algorithm can learn from and attempt to target. How I'm not here to talk about the morality of targeting or of data collection. I'm just telling you how it works. So let's move on one step. We'll move on to geofencing. 
Geofencing is a fancy name for just selecting an area to advertise in. There is specific geofencing advertising. Um, geofencing advertising is pretty expensive. Um, you're usually looking at at least a thousand dollars and kind of going up from there. Um, but you kind of need to be in the fifteen hundred to two thousand dollar range before you're going to get any real action out of it. But an example of that would be like. Josh's company could put a geofence around every other car dealership in the, on the west side and say, if anyone has been physically in any of these car dealerships, we want to show them an ad for Dick's Auto. That would be an example of uh, geofencing. Same idea would be if you have, say you're a law firm, you're a defense lawyer, you would geofence the courthouse and the jail and say, anybody who's been in those locations, I want to show them an ad. And then you would exclude people who work for the county. So, because you don't want to advertise necessarily to the people who work there. Anyways, so that's how geofencing works. YouTube, the 100% think people should be posting on YouTube for their business. It is the easiest way to get a good search engine boost, right? Because um, you can, that video that you put can show up in search results. And I guarantee you, almost no businesses are doing it. So, sorry, excuse me. Um, I have a guy that I interviewed on my podcast a few weeks ago. Um, he worked with an insurance agency in upstate New York, and they have this obscure insurance, like business insurance policy that you have to have for businesses in New York. And every year when businesses register, the state will send them out a letter saying they need this insurance. And he has a video that explains what that is. And he made that video eight years ago. And he said that their company makes over a hundred thousand dollars a year in policies for this business insurance from that one video, because nobody else has a video explaining what it is. So every business owner who gets this thing, they go to Google and they go, chick, 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 they type in what is blah, blah, blah insurance. And this video pops up and they watch it and they call. There should be a video of whatever you do for your business, plus the name of the city you're in. So if you are a plumber in Hillsborough, right, you should be like, I'm going to make a video and call it Hillsborough Plumbing with blah, 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 and talk about what your business does, who you have, how you're going to keep people safe, um, what's the process to hire them, all that kind of stuff. You could do it yourself. You can shoot it with your phone. You don't need a bunch of production on it. Also, you can advertise on YouTube. So um, I don't know if any of, your, uh, any of your house is like my house, but uh, my kid, for one, uh, as well as, as myself and Carrie, YouTube is just another channel now. You go onto your TV or your box or your Fire TV or whatever it is that you use, and there's, the channels are like Hulu and Netflix and you know, YouTube, right? It's just another channel that you can watch on your television now. So if you, you, YouTube is like being able to put your information about your business on a TV network for free. And if you really want to reach people, you run ads and you geo target the area of usually your city. So if you're in Hillsboro and you make a little quick video, it can be if it's six seconds or less, people can't skip it. If it's more than six seconds, then um, you can have through play, which means you don't get charged until they watch at least 15 seconds. And then there's also some kind of longer format ones you could do. Most of those you don't need. So you have a six to 30 second video that you advertise on YouTube. You can advertise on YouTube for a couple hundred bucks a month and target Hillsboro. Um, so we have a client in Lake Oswego who we've been using YouTube's ads with for years now. And, um, uh, I think, you know, we spend probably a few thousand dollars a year on those videos and they get over a hundred thousand views on YouTube. Everybody, everywhere our client goes says, Hey, I saw you on TV from his YouTube video ads. So YouTube ads are great at least make a video and put it on YouTube and make sure you link it back to your website. Um, if you have gamers, younger people, stuff like that, do it yourself. Twitch is a good option for that. It's basically just like YouTube. Um, 
direct sales ads, that's if you're going to sell a specific product. So that would be Facebook, Google, Pinterest, Bing. Uh, all of those places are great for direct sales. That is if you're selling retail products. Um, Facebook and Google and Bing, um, you can upload what they call your product catalog. That means you could put every product you have and have that available for sale on those sites. You can also make advertising that pulls those products automatically based on um, the targeting that you've selected. So those are some options. Um, getting into um, catalog ads and stuff gets a little more complicated. That's a whole nother presentation for an hour that is not this one. Um, you can advertise on other networks. CPM is, is the um, acronym for figuring out how much it costs on each advertising platform. So CPM stands for cost per meg. It's an old holdback from the TV advertising world. It's the cost to reach a thousand people. So right now the average cost on Facebook to reach a thousand people, if it's a local business ad, it's about $16 to reach a thousand people. Uh, if it's uh, a very specifically targeted ad, I've seen that get down to as low as three to five bucks to reach a thousand people. If you are just sharing videos and stuff like on YouTube and other places, I've seen it get down below a dollar. Um, I mean, if you can reach a thousand people for a dollar, that's a good day. So CPM is the metric that you need. If you look at something like LinkedIn ads, LinkedIn ads are super expensive. Um, and usually they're only purchased by large companies with humongous budgets. Um, a YouTube ad is going to be on average about maybe 80 to $120 to reach a thousand people. Uh, but again, super targeted at business people. Um, we haven't seen a good return on LinkedIn ads. Um, there's also ads on pretty much every platform at this point. You get Twitter ads, and Reddit ads, and um, I mean, it's really going to depend on, on, on what you're doing. But for most people, Google ads, Bing ads, Facebook ads is where it's at. So we should talk quickly about email marketing also. Um, so email ads, you, you want to make sure that you don't mass email from your own email address. So you don't want to just take all your clients and stick them in Outlook and like fire them an email because you can get your email account blocked or banned. Um, you can get spam blocked. There's all kinds of bad stuff that can happen. You want to use a mail provider, a mail marketing provider. MailChimp is a good one. It's free up to 1,500 subscribers. There are lots of other mail providers out there. There's Clavio, Constant Contact, Drip, Rasa. Um, I don't even know them all. There's, there's got to be hundreds of them. So pick the one that you like the best, put your emails in there, export them out of your CRM system or your customer management database or however you have them uh, held, put them in there and send them an email to tell them how they can do business with you now. So that information that we went over earlier about how are you going to keep them safe? Are you open? What are your current hours? How do they get it? all that information you want to put into an email and send it to your customers so that they know how to do business with you. Um, a lot of people talk about um, permission marketing, which I also talk about all the time. I think in this case, even though people may not have opted in to get emails from you, telling them how they can do business with you in the current climate is fine. Sending them an email every day is not fine. So you want to send them one, just tell them how they can do business with you, get to the point, don't make a big story about it. People don't have time, especially in their mailbox. They don't want to be reading all day long. They just want to know what you got, how you can get it, you know, what's going on, how you're going to keep them safe, right? Um, you can ask your customers on social media to get on your mailing list. So if you have, like, say you have a MailChimp list, then MailChimp will give you a subscriber link that you can share. Um, you can share that and say, hey, if you want the latest updates, get on our list, yada, yada, yada. If you're going to send something out to all your customers, you could also put in a link for them to sign up for your list because you can have more than one list. So you could send one blast or two out to all of your existing clients and contacts. Asking them if they want to subscribe to your mailing list 
then you can send them mail on a regular basis. Um, what you don't want is to keep sending unwanted email to people um, because I mean, they might unsubscribe the first time, but then if you send them something again after you've already unsubscribed, they're gonna start marking it as spam, then your account gets blocked, and then you can't send anybody email, and that becomes a problem. Um, another thing that you can do is survey your clients. So you can send out a survey and say, you know, um, do, would you, you know, uh, need expanded hours from us? Is there something that we can offer that we're not doing right now? Um, you know, how are you doing with the COVID? How is it affecting your business? Like there's different things that you can survey your clients about. You can also collaborate with other people who already have a list. So if you don't have a mailing list and somebody else does, then um, you could do a collaboration with them and say, you know, hey, um, you know, like uh, a good example might be something like um, businesses that, that work in close proximity is a good idea. So it might be like, say, downtown Hillsboro, um, bag and baggage has been doing like the, um, like a local business spotlight. So they'll take, uh, they did Insomnia Coffee the other day. So Insomnia Coffee was in bag and baggage's newsletter and they mailed that out to everybody saying, look, here's the business of the week. And so that is a, a collaboration where they're getting out to somebody's mailing list that isn't their own mailing list. Um, and yeah, on your social media or whatever, you know, get updates straight to your inbox and here's the link to get it. So that's a good way to do that. Um, follow up and outreach is the, this is kind of the last bit follow up and then follow up and follow up some more. The biggest loss in business, um, in general is a lack of follow up. So, um, if you talk about industries that aren't impulse buys, the average conversion rate is anywhere from about 4% to about 17% for the first time a business or a person goes to your website or walks physically into a business. That's really low. Um, that means there's at least 83% of people who didn't buy from you. And there's all kinds of ways to improve those, uh, to improve follow-up. There's some automated follow-up you could do. If you have a website, that's you can do abandoned cart campaigns. Um, you can have, if people, you know, register with your business in some way for a contest or something like that, you want to be following up with emails. Um, if you have information from customers like addresses, um, you can send them thank you letters. Uh, you just want to follow up. If it's more of a one-to-one -one business kind of thing, you want to be following up with people. Um, shoot them a message, say, ask them how it's going, all kinds of stuff that you can do with follow-up. You can research that on your own. Um, there's lots of ways to do it. It's also important to reach out to your clients and your past clients and see how they're doing right now. And that can generate revenue. Um, I know as soon as there was quarantine and lockdown here, we started going through our client list and just calling everyone and, and like connecting either through email or an instant message or a phone call and saying, hey, you know, how's things going? We had some ideas for your business and, and you know, try to produce any value that we can for them. And then, you know, there is some of that led to increased business for my company and some of it led to some referrals that has turned into business for us. So make sure you're out there contacting people. Um, you can also use places like LinkedIn to do research on what other people are in your industry and then you can have contact with them. Um, so I think from there, uh, make sure you do your networking. Hillsborough Chamber, obviously, is a good one. Wake Up Hillsborough. There's BNI, CMK Connections, Networking, Quarantine Coffee Club, Network After Work. All of those are events that are held online right now. Um, there's a Marketing Happy Hour live stream that I mentioned earlier. You can also make your own networking group. Here's how to start your own networking group. Make, a, make an event on Zoom, right? Make a free Zoom meeting and then tell people to come to it. Ta -da! Now you can network with people. But these other ones that are more structured are already gonna have people coming to them. Um, you can get important information about events and stuff like that. And uh, I think networking is definitely something that's gonna help right now. And it, you know, it's a good break from 
maybe the only person you talk to all day is, is your to toddler or, or your spouse, right? So it's uh, good to get out and, and talk to some other people and, and see if there's some business synergies and stuff out there. Have some one-to-ones with people offline if you have time right now. See if there's stuff you can help each other with. All that stuff's a great way uh, to drive some business. So uh, I think we can open it up to questions. Um, Deanna, if you wanted to unmute everybody. You're the host, Matt. Oh, sorry. I guess I have to unmute everybody. So if you have a question, you'll have to physically raise your hand because I can't see the chat. And I can monitor that if they want to, if you're more comfortable putting your question in the chat. I can read. Jen? Hey, Matt. Um, any tips for um, e-commerce kind of getting products moved that way? Yes. What's the best way to go about that? So you want to make sure that you have them on your website. They're available for sale and somebody can purchase them. That is something like Shopify, uh, WooCommerce. You can get that done pretty easily and pretty quickly. Um, if you have a larger product catalog, um, there may be something that you need to like work with your inventory system. It can get a little more complicated in that. Also, if you have things like apparel where they're sizing, you know, like, you know, shoes where the shoe sizes that you only have in stock and stuff like that. So there's different, um, different kind of concerns in those things. Um, I think that the easiest way to manage getting stuff online is basically you're going to just need to pick a platform and go with it or get a provider you know, like us or any other e-commerce provider can help you get your business online. Once you have your product online and you're going to start selling it, um, it's important not to just jump out of the gate and be like, buy my stuff, buy my stuff, buy my stuff all over Facebook because that's what everybody's already doing. Um, so you're going to want to have um, kind of sell the experience, right? Sell the end result that someone's looking for. Um, there's a lot of examples of that. Um, so it's kind of hard to get into just off the top of my head. Um, there's also lots and lots of ways that you can improve your conversion rates on e-commerce websites. The first thing that you should always do on an e-commerce website, once people are able to purchase stuff, is you want to set up abandoned cart. And abandoned cart means somebody added something to their shopping cart, but they left. You want it to send them an email and say, you know, hey, did you forget something? And then they can, you know, get back in and, and purchase it. We've seen a lift of 20 to 30%, in some cases 60% on companies when they set up abandoned cart on their e-commerce store. So Matt, we have a question. Um, yeah. Should we um, always have, have info on our website about COVID-19 and is live chat on real estate agents of website good to have? So if I was a real estate agent, I would definitely have live chat. 100%. Um, and the live chat can have an automated response that says, hey, I'll get back to you as quickly as I can kind of thing. And then you can, you can message them. Usually you want that connected up to something on your phone since you always have your phone with you if you're a real estate agent. The other thing is you should have, um, I think you want to have a COVID statement on your website if you're in a business where you're going to be talking to people. So if you're a real estate agent, you should be talking right now about virtual open houses, about how you're going to schedule times for showings. Um, maybe you're using something like um, shoe booties, gloves, masks, all of that stuff to go into houses if they're occupied. Unoccupied houses, you can talk about cleaning. Um, you know, we, these houses are being professionally cleaned every day between all the different showings. Um, virtual open house, again, you can do that with something like Zoom or you can use something like StreamYard where you can have somebody walking through the house and you could be on screen talking about it at the same time. You can broadcast those or stream them on Facebook if you want to do open house. Um, so there's lots of ways to do it. Matt, I would just add that if you are going to provide COVID-19 resources on your website, just be really, really careful that they are official resources, um, CDC kind of stuff and not something that leads back to 
something is not true or some kind of a scam. Um, there's a lot of information out there and not all of it is accurate or correct or an official site. Yeah, I would only post stuff that you're going to do. I don't think you should link out to other resources. If people want to get those resources, they can get them a million other places. They don't have to get them from your you know, real estate site or whatever. Yeah, that's a good. The other thing is you, you said with the live chat. So there's an app that you, would, you need to add to your site in your phone to be able to do that. Yeah, you're going to need to, it's going to depend on if you have an agent site, like that's maybe it's provided by uh, your brokerage. So if, if your website but, is your own, then you can add whatever you want to it. But yeah, I'm, I'm independent. I'm my, I'm my own. So, All right. So yeah, there's, I can, uh, if you want, it's Matt at hookseo.com and I can give you a list of a few different options that you can add. Uh, most of them are free up to a certain point. Right. Um, but you know, unless you're, you know, crushing a few hundred deals a year, you're not going to need paid online chat. You can probably get a free one that's going to work. Great. And what was that? What was your email again? It's Matt, M-A-T-T, -T, at hookseo.com. Great. Thank you. I got the chat back, so I can put it in there now. <laughs> All right. Who else has a question? We still have a little bit of time. Four minutes. Four minutes. All right. Really? No, no questions. I mean, you've got like the marketing expert, you know, technology expert, Betty, there you go. I, I have one. Um, how important is it to have your site and, and what are the legalities of having your site be um, friendly to those who are ADA so it can read itself if you're blind or whatever? How important is that? And I know there are legalities coming out around that. So it's not legalities that are coming out The the legal framework has already existed for a while. It's just that nobody was getting sued for it until recently. So right. ADA compliant is a legal requirement of your business. So your website has to be ADA compliant. Now there is no official structure of what makes something on a website ADA compliant. So it's pretty wishy-washy law. Like they're like, it has to be ADA compliant, but we're not going to tell you what ADA compliant means. So the best thing to do is okay. there is ADA checkers online that you can use. Um, there's also a plugin that you can get if you have a WordPress site, there's an ADA compliance plugin. The most important thing that you need to do is you need to have contrast on text versus background so that people can see um, who may be colorblind or other things like that. And then there's also, you need to have images, need to have alt tags. Alt tags say what the image is. So if you have an image of like a couple sleeping bags in a tent, the alt tag would be two sleeping bags in a tent. And that way, if somebody's using a screen reader because they're blind, they know what was in the image. Also, um, text that's too small. Um, and that's pretty much it. I mean, there's, there's a few other guidelines. There's some stuff about anchor tags and stuff that I won't get into, but if you're worried about ADA compliance, hit me up. There's my email. Um, but I, I would say for the most part, unless you're a business with over a million dollars of revenue, nobody's going to sue you for ADA compliance. Excellent. Thank you, Matt, Thank you. so much. This has been a great uh, amount of information. Thank you for sharing it all. Um, we've recorded it, so we will be sharing it out with folks that couldn't join us today. Um, tomorrow, the Small Business Solutions Series workshop is um, going re-entry, reopening. Um, I'm sorry, Teresa, do you have a question? No, I was stopping. Oh, sorry. I always get those confused. Um, so tomorrow it's about, um, you know, opening your business and, and re-entering, bringing in your workforce. We have an attorney, Mike McClory, who is an employer attorney. So he works for owners, not the employees. And he do, has done a lot of work around um, compliance issues, ADA, um, all sorts of different um, work that he's been working with with employers for many, many years. And this is an opportunity for employers to ask questions about, you know, what is, can I, you know, can I force my, my employee to come back to work? What if they tell me they don't want to work because they're afraid? What if they want to stay teleworking? Would I need them in the office? 
what are those kinds of things? How do I protect my employees? What are the, what, you know, how do I manage expectations, fear, that sort of thing? It's going to be a great program. Hope you can join us 10 o'clock tomorrow right here again, Matt, thank you so much. Great information. And it's so nice to see all of you. Um, have a great and safe rest of your week. Thank you. Bye everybody.